I mean, it's a small but a neat bunch. <laughs> We're very fortunate to have with us tonight uh, Stuart Wheeler from the Tank Museum Archive and Library. He's a MA alumnus and has been at the Tank Museum since 2005 and must be one of the foremost minds on armoured warfare and armoured vehicles in the country. He's going to present to us tonight on, uh, well, he's going to take a look at the evolution of theories of armoured warfare and how that played into reality. After that, we're going to take a brief stop for refreshments, and afterwards, he'd be more than happy to field questions either on the topic or um, armoured warfare as a whole, or the music itself. So, a uh, round of applause to start. If I'm clever, I should leave now, because that's probably my best piece of applause. Um, thanks very much, John. As John says, I'm, I'm from the Tank Museum, and we have a large collection. And um, what I'm hoping to do with this talk is to basically show you the evolution of armoured doctrine in four specific nations. Um, the, the key thing is that we've been exploring from really the First World War up to the start of the Second World War, with the British, the French, the German, and the Russians. And we're going to be specifically looking at how, how um, armour doctrine develops, but in, the, in, in an infantry tank context. So I'll start the well, basically talk now, really. Now, this is just jumping a bit forward. This is 1936, and uh, this group of uh, officers is taken at the, um, basically at Bovington, which is a, which is a on the camp, which is actually the Royal Tank Corps training headquarters at that time. Um, this is quite a, a distinct group, because in the centre is the um, German General um, von Blomberg. And so this is the gen German General Staff with Luftwaffe and other, um, other officers attached to them coming on a visit to the UK. Now, what I'm trying to say with this, this image is that the fact that there's an awful lot, though we're building up to war, we're obviously getting the, um, the rise of Hitler has already started, and tensions are going to start to creep in. The military are still all there, and they're all still sort of gathering information on each other, and they're still allowing it. So, not only is this going on, but the British are sending Martel um, over to uh, Russia, to Moscow, and he's watching what's going on with Christie and the light tanks, which were then were coming to the T-34. Everyone's watching what each other people are doing, and they're picking up what's going on. So that's quite an important picture. An interesting slight little bit out of it was the fact that the Germans remarked at the time, basically to themselves, that the, the British officers seemed to disappear on a Friday afternoon. Later on a Friday afternoon, they disappeared, and they wouldn't come back till Monday morning. Now, the Germans were basing then what they would normally do, which was that they would be off on secret manoeuvres. That's what the Germans would do. Of course, the British officers at that time were off to London and to Bournemouth to hit the night spots. Um, again, it's, it's how you perceive things. And this is what the, uh, the, the Germans were doing. Right, going back to the start, really, we're really getting to why the tank appears on the battlefield in the first place. First World War, trenches, okay? August 1914, we have a mobile fluid um, battlefield. It's not really until um, November that, and the, and the sort of chase to the sea up onto the Belgian coast, where the, the Germans are trying to get to the sea, and the British and the French and the Belgians are stopping them, that we start getting this, this, this sort of trench system developing. It really takes uh, sort of uh, firm sort of emplacement in, by about February 1915, and that's basically from the Belgian border, well, Belgian coast, all the way down to Switzerland, and you get this trench developing. What that is doing is it's allowing machine guns, things like the Maxim, to basically dominate that terrain of no man's land. And it's costing a high amount of um, cost in uh, infantry life. The British Expeditionary Force, very fine um, uh, infantry force at that time, small, regular force is decimated by the machine gun. And this is really having a big impact back home in, in, in Britain in, the late, in late 1914, early 1915. And people are sending lots and lots of ideas about how to defeat 
not only the machine gun, but also how to get across and, and protect themselves from artillery. And people are coming up with ideas about pushing um, um, infantry shields in front of them, shields uh, made of metal with little wheels, you can push those in front of people coming up with big wheels to cross no man's land, etc. But what we're coming up with is, is trying to get across that, that barbed wire where you see the infantry going here. And really what happens is, by late 14, early 15, Winston Churchill, first Lord of the Admiralty, comes up with the Atlantic Committee, and they, with the Messrs. Tristan and Wilson, come up with this tank here. This is the first tank. It's called Little Willie, and basically it's about mobility. So we have an armoured shell with tracks on it. It started off with tractor tracks. Tractors have already been around for a good number of years. They've been used by the Royal Artillery. But they're putting on this smaller tract unit here to allow it to cross no man's land, to break through the barbed wire and to cross um, the dangerous area between the German lines and the British lines. And what they're trying to do is crush the wire and get infantry over to the other side. It's really there at this stage, really just to protect the, um, the infantry. And this is like, we're looking at the autumn of 1915 that's arriving. At the same time as that, they're trying this vehicle, they come up with this shape. This is a rhomboid shape, this one's a female. This is a Mark IV. We've got two classes of tanks for the, for the British heavy, heavy tanks. And basically, they're, they're female ones have two machine guns in each sponson. When they're male, which I'll show you in a minute, they have a, a six pounder gun in each sponson. And these are basically, a, really, what the idea is, is that they've taken the small tracks and they made basically a rhomboid shape, a lodging shaped tank. That whole track area there allows you to cross trenches, cross no man's land in a far better way. So you grab hold where the track horns are up front, where the F4 is, and that can grip into the trench and climb out. But it's there to support the infantry, and that's the point. It's break through the wire, break over the trenches, over no man's land, and support the infantry. And there we have a six pounder gun in that spot in there. That's a Mark V. It's got the um, cab at the back there. By the time we get to the Mark V, we're improving. So the Mark IVs, you're looking at about two and a half miles an hour. The Mark Vs, you're getting up to four, four and a half miles an hour. These are only meant to go as fast as the infantry go. It's an infantry support vehicle, and that's the key thing. No one at this stage is thinking of any, anything else. So what we get is we start getting ideas, though, after the Battle of Combray. The Battle of Combray, we, we used nine tank battalions, um, and basically with Mark IV tanks, we, we effectively break through the German lines. The, this is 20th of November 1917, and for the only time in the war, the bells in the UK are rung, church bells are rung, finally broken through the German lines after all these years of battle, and, and finally got through. And what's happening is the idea that starts going into the tank corps, the people who are in the tank corps, there's a special unit basically that's been formed from the Heavy Brush and Machine Gun Corps, and they are the tank corps, and they're given the job of operating tanks. So, so we're up to that level. They are starting to think, well, hang on a second, if we had a, a lot more tanks, we've used 386 tanks in this Battle of Combray. If we use a few more and have a few more reserves, and we have faster tanks, maybe we could do a proper breakthrough and wouldn't have to rely on the cavalry. They're using special tanks with uh, wire crosses to break them through the wire, hopefully getting the cavalry across. The cavalry never get across because they just can't get through that wire or they're mowed down by machine guns. So what they're looking at is things like the, the, the whippet here, which went to eight miles an hour. And basically they're trying to come up with ideas to try and exploit behind the wire. So you're using the heavy tanks basically as your support tanks to get the infantry across and through the wire and supporting them and then you're using your, um, what they known as a cavalry tank, to basically exploit. And so this is what we, we get to by the end of the sort of, the end of um, World War I with the British. Um, what we've got here is SS214, and what we're looking at is the tanks period first in battle in September 1916. This is basically two years later, and doctrines coming along, they're starting to think how to use them in action with other, other um, uh, units and how to use them with infantry. But basically, they recognise that the tanks, when they're closed down, they've got their visors down, their sights down, they are almost blind. When you're in there, you've got eight men inside there with you, um, you are 
you're closing yourself down, the Germans are hitting you with machine gun bullets, it's all rattling around and you've got little slits, periscopes, prisms. You are trying to see what's going around you. It really needs, um, there's smoke on the battlefield, etc. You're undulating, there's no suspension in this tank and you're moving around that battlefield very hard to know where you are. Um, and they recognise that in here and they recognise how important it is to have combined arms. And this really comes out just at the moment that we get the attack at um, Amiens in um, April 1918, which really starts the ball rolling. We have a mass of tanks. We're, we're talking 400-odd uh, tanks, four, 500-odd tanks, being used all along the line. The French are doing the same, as I'll come on to later. And basically, we start hitting the Germans with combined arms. So what's going on is the tanks and the troops who are supporting the tank are training together. They're getting used to each other, support arms as well, the artillery are getting involved, and we're able to push through and basically keep the Germans on the back foot. And that's really what's going on. So it's a really, really effective tank. Uh, um, a really, really effective sort of doctrine that's been developed. And when you look at World War I, what's happened in those last few months, August, September, October, when they're just pushing the Germans back, um, week after week, the tanks are used in that first phase as a sort of breakthrough bit. They're mechanically still very unreliable, and that's one of the, the, the main things that people will um, talk about. They'll, they'll say, you know, oh, but the tanks get breaking down, and such. you didn't have that many after the first 24 hours, the crews were tired out. But they still allowed that first breakthrough, and if you look at the German records and sources, they're saying that they feared the tank. It was this that changed the battlefield for them in that way, because it, it was another element. You are suddenly getting your six-pounder gun that can, that can fire at you, knock out your machine guns. You can also get a machine gun that can um, knock out your actual troops uh, that are in front of you. You've got um, an armoured machine moving towards you, which is hard to knock out. And it's another thing that they've got to combat against. It's not just infantry and artillery, it's tanks. And we use those with the aircraft as well. It's combined arms warfare that's pushing this. And it's really that, that I would say that that last few months is really the height of armoured warfare until we reach World War II. Those last few months of the key bit, along with the French, that is, it gets forgotten quite quickly how developed we were by that period. Again, the doctrine is still being written, um, they're still learning, but it's really, Still quite difficult. Here you can see this is training again in 1918. Staff officers watching what's going on. Mark 5 there, supporting the infantry. And they would have trained for a number of days, supporting them. The big problem is you have to have the infantry who are training with the tanks, keeping with the tanks. If you put in another infantry unit that's never seen tanks before, then it all goes um, pretty much um, out of whack. You've got to have the tanks moving at the same pace as the infantry and vice versa. If one gets ahead of the other, then they're both in trouble. They're using their best attributes. The attributes of the tank are to knock out the emplacements, machine gun places, and the um, artillery emplacements. What the infantry are doing is they're suppressing and securing the fracks, they're suppressing the German um, artillery pieces, etc. so allow the tanks to get up there. So they're both combining their best aspects. Here you go again, another shot. There are, the big problem here is that because uh, cameras weren't really allowed on the battlefield, you don't get a lot of action shots. And when they are, they're quite indistinct. So you have to rely quite a lot on, on um, either training shots or shots like this, where it, it pretty much you can see there, Mark, from a female moving across. We've got, what we've got now is the white, red, white stripe at the front of the vehicle. That's because aircraft are becoming involved. We've got the modern battlefield on here. Infantry are moving, they're running, there's none of that walking across the side slowly, etc. The whole the infantry have moved up, doctrine's trained and changing, and we've got really quite a, a, a very organised, a very well rehearsed um, army at this stage. This one is taken from 1928, it's a film called Victory, and that, would, that gives you a great impression of what it would like to have been on the battlefield, following the tanks in. They've understood when they first bring the tanks out in 1915, in September 1916, the Battle of First Course of they used 32 of them, 32 of the age able to move. When they're, as I said, when they're, when they're looking at Combray and Amiens later on in 17 and 18, they're using mass amount of tanks. 
And it's this mass that is really stuck in on the head, that basically if you use large amounts of tanks with infantry and artillery support, with aircraft, you can pretty much break through the, these static positions. And we've got a return to mobile warfare. The other thing they recognise as well, this is, it, is that this is, a, um, this is in the summer of 1917, was you had to choose your ground carefully. Yes, you've got a tank that can actually do a good job and support the infantry, but if it's stuck in the mud, it isn't going to help you anywhere. And, and the big problem for the tanks, because they move quite slowly and they're mechanically unreliable, is that they tend to break down or would shut um, very good targets for the um, German um, artillery pieces. And the German artillery pieces were the key problem for the British. Um, those tanks move slowly. If you're static for too long, you'll be hit by a, an artillery piece basically firing at you. This is probably, and I would say the, one of the greatest regrets is that this tank appears, this is an armoured personnel carrier, this is the Mark 9, and this appears just at the war's end. It's too late to go into action. Now, it would have been very interesting if this had been used in the summer of 1918, because we may have seen other countries adopt armoured personnel, fully enclosed armoured personnel carriers, in the interwar period and into World War II, um, rather than just half-tracks. Um, well, there were about 40 of these, and you could get a, a, about 30 men inside that. Again, the old idea was to get men across uh, no man's land, exposed areas, intact, to get to the other side, and actually get out and then start attacking to their infantry role. So it's, a, it's basically what armoured personnel carriers called battlefield taxes. Well, and that was the idea. Protect them, get them to the front, support it by the tanks, etc. But it arrived too late, and no one really remembers it, and that's the problem. So we've had our personnel carriers in the First World War, but right at the end, and they just sort of get forgotten, and have to be remembered again. Now, this is uh, Major General um, J.F.C. Fuller, and he comes up with Plan 19, 1919 really, and he's got this idea that you, you use a large tank force and, and basically break for the German lines, but it already happened, and he becomes the leading advocate in the early 20s about the use of tanks with the, um, with the tank corps on the British side of things. But what's happening with the tanks as well is the fact that um, we're really looking at the establishment of the tank corps, what becomes the Royal Tank Corps in 1923, as a body. They're doing what the RAF are doing. RAF comes from the Royal Flying Corps to, the, to become the Royal, the Royal Air Force. Basically, when you're forming yourself as a new corps or a new unit, you need to, they, they are very jealous of keeping everything to themselves. So, it's the same way as the RAF would like, wouldn't want to give any plans out to anyone else to use because it starts diluting your reason and your purpose for being there, the same way as that's what the Royal Tank Corps are doing. They don't want to give the tanks to anybody else. They're jealous of it. Because they start seeing, if we start diluting it, and we start giving them to, say, the infantry or the artillery, etc. What have we got? What they'll, they'll get rid of us. Men are joining that the Royal Tank Corps because it's seen as as new. It's uh, modernism. It, it's 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 bringing um, pushing the, the the boundaries. It's it's about what the 20th century is about. It's about mechanicalisation. It's about getting vehicles on there. But what happens is, of course, is that we have after the First World War, we have a massive reduction in the size of the army. So by the end of the war, you've got 18 full tank battalions in the tank corps. You've got seven in training. By about 1920, you're down to four battalions. Massive reduction, don't need this large army. And what they're doing is they're basically, because everyone's seen that the tanks are really, oh, that's the First World War thing, it's just for um, beating trenches, crossing trenches, we're going to have to use you in, in other purposes. They start using um, armoured cars, and they start going out to India, to Iraq in the early 20s, etc., um, Northwest Frontier, and they're being used wherever, you, wherever the British are policing the empire, they're actually being used as armoured car companies, and they'll take an infantry battalion, they'll remove that and replace it with an armoured car company. And that's what the tank corps are adapting. They're adapting to this. They're saying, OK, it's not a tank, but it's an armoured vehicle, we'll grab that. And they're learning all the time. So they want to keep hold, and this is what the advocates 
on, on the tank crew are trying to do. They're trying to make sure that they maintain a grip on any armoured fighting vehicle. They don't even, you know, it, tanks is really important, but we don't want their armoured cars out as well. We don't want to give anyone the chance to get rid of us. And that's the mentality, it's the back of their head. They're all looking as well for basically more manoeuvrability. The key advocates are in the tank court are looking to sort of, again, they look at Combray. The whole point of Combray is we could have won the war if we were managed to have, we had tanks that could exploit. And that's the idea. So they want tanks that aren't just going to support the infantry. Most of them don't want to be tied to the infantry because the infantry only needs slow vehicles. So they want to go fast. They want to do really do exploit and capture and basically do what, they were, uh, what sort of JFC Fuller was saying was attack the sort of rear areas and tap the control mechanisms of the enemy and that's what the British and the Royal Tank Corps really want to do. They want to get faster tanks. Here we have little um, Martel's with one man tank. His idea was to have a mass, mass amount of tanks. You'd have battalions of these. Instead of infantry you would give everyone a, a little uh, one man tank with a machine gun. And it's sublime to ridiculous here because that tank on the side of it is in independent, comes in 1922-23. And that has a three pound gun in the turret and then four little sub turrets. Um, very hard for the commander to actually command that tank. But this is an idea that's coming on. The whole idea from the First World War was land ships. It's how it started off. They, they conceived it as, um, you know, Royal Navy with, the, with Winston Churchill. But the whole idea was you would be commanding sh ships on land. And that takes it to the, the logical sort of conclusion that you would have this sort of battleship that could aim at different directions, etc. The big problem for the commander, of course, is he can't control what everyone's doing in those building um, sub-turrets. Um, also, the problem with that tank was it's too long for its width, which means turning it is, is nigh on impossible. Great going in a straight line, but you try turning that, it's just not got the turning ability. Um, and so, it's a bit of a dead end. But this isn't. This is the first time we see, for the British Army, a turreted tank. And this is the Vickers Medium. There are a number of vehicles that uh, come in between, etc. But I'm picking out the, the main, main ones. Again here we can see, um, we've still got this idea that we need a machine gun on the side of the vehicle. So we've got a Vickers in there. We've got a three pounder there in the, in the turret. We've got a coaxial machine gun there. We're sprouting other machine guns at the rear of the turret. This starts to disappear. People get used to the idea that they, you can't have too many men inside. But what we're getting is this idea of mobility. It's really pushing that. And at this stage, in the 1920s and into the 30s, the idea is that there's a lot of belief that the, um, that the anti-tank gun, it starts to get tw late 20s into the 30s, the anti-tank gun will always defeat the tank. So what they're doing is that here, they're taking very lightly armoured, about eight millimetres worth of armour, and they're saying, well, this can move at, play 15, 18 miles an hour, so we'll use its speed as its defence. There are three areas of, of tank design, which is basically protection, firepower, and mobility. And depending what you want a tank to do, so if you want to go faster, you'll have less armour on it, which makes it basically lighter, so it can go faster. If you want more, if you want more protection on it, it's going to impact on its ability to move, so that's going to impact on it. So there's all these little elements that go into tank design, but basically, this was very popular at that time, and it allowed the um, Royal Tank Corps to start trialling things. So by the mid-1920s, 26, 27, we're getting what's known as experimental mechanised force. And they're basically combining tanks like the Vickers Medium with uh, small um, carrier-led um, things like the Vickers Lloyd, uh, Carbon Lloyd carrier. Um, they're using lorry infantry. They're starting to think about, let's, oh, hang on a second, let's have, um, um, we can't leave the artillery point, but let's start bringing in sort of artillery that can move as well. They're doing, um, they're having small battles out in, on Salisbury Plain, etc. And these are pretty much being reported by people like Basil Little Hart. So you don't even need to be too far away. These are being reported, not in just the Telegraph, but all the smaller newspapers as well. And they're updating on a, on a sort of daily sort of um, basis. And they'll even print maps. If you wanted to get out in your car, you could go and watch them on Salisbury Plain because you'd know where they were the next day. None of this is secret. And this is what's going on. So, Little Hearts publicising it. 
a lot of other newspapers are publicising it, and people are coming to watch, and the Germans are coming to watch, and everyone's coming to watch, really. And then you, we've got pictures of them with bystanders standing at the side of the road watching them all manoeuvre. And they're pitching red against blue across large expanses of sort of um, Wiltshire, etc. And this is all going on. It's all being watched. People are looking at mechanised warfare. They're seeing, what they're seeing as well is that move away from the trench. People, people are excited by this in a way because it's, it's not static. It's not got the, the whole idea of the slaughter of the First World War. We've moved it away. It's not about men sitting in a trench getting blown up by pieces of shrapnel or high explosive or cut down by machine guns. These men are moving fast and their idea is to knock the enemy out quickly. It's about fast war, about achieving things quickly. And this is what we've got, so that, you know, this is the manoeuvres, we've got loads of people milling around there, these are all journalists and officers, etc. They're all embracing the sort of modernity of, the, of these vehicles, um, peering in. There's nothing really secret. So these ideas are really going abroad as well. Britain is the leading nation at this time, as we're exploring with the other nations, and this is allowing everyone else who may not be able to afford tanks, or may not be that involved in the uh, development of doctrine or tactics to come and have a look. And people are doing that. Now, this is um, George Lindsay. Now, he was very important in, in the tanks uh, well, with the armored cars out in Iraq. Um, and he'd been developing long range um, tactics reconnaissance out in Iraq. Um, and, but he starts taking over sort of another sort of advocate in the Royal Tank Corps and pushing forward, and he's probably one of the leading um, proponents of, of really this mobile force. Um, and he unfortunately probably would have been the best person to lead Britain into the mid-1930s and onwards, taking on, but unfortunately there was a problem with his wife being ill, and he performed very badly in the manoeuvres in 1934. By this time we got up to what is known as uh, basically um, we got to the experimental mechanised force, we got up to the armoured force, and we saw them to a, basically a tank brigade, and they're trying new, new, new types of um, tactics and, and new types of vehicles. But unfortunately, not through just his own, own fault, but possibly because his mind was on, on other things, his wife, etc., he performed badly, and this damaged his career, and he basically goes into obscurity. It would have been really handy if he'd have survived and was able to push it off. But the British Army are hampering the sort of development of, of armoured warfare at this stage because at the bottom of the pile of picking up any money are the tanks. There's not much money in there. They're probably getting less than £100,000 a year to spend on tanks. Um, and there's really only one manufacturer. You're looking at Vickers. Um, broad ordnance a little bit, but there's only one manufacturer. There's no, you can't go into a, build a tank and say, oh, you know, I want you to build an engine for it. They're not doing that. People are having to take an engine out of something else, out of aircraft, out of buses, and put them actually into their tank. This is quite a sort of ad hoc uh, method of actually producing vehicles, etc., uh, and developing um, a proper strategy and adoption. Here we can see this is what they would have been doing on those training exercises, again, moving across, using these uh, medium tanks in large numbers. It's again, again about mass. Um, the Germans are watching this obviously very closely, same with the Russians. The people are picking up ideas. This is again shows the small lanes. There were times, as I said, people were sending out their own cars. Even people in the infantry and cavalry who were pitted against them, they would send their wives and um, relatives out in little cars to try and stop them by blocking up the, um, the roadways, etc. And here we have, and this is what you've got as well, is you've got, this is umpire in front here, and they normally have a white band on them. And basically, they're going around, and this is before you have any sort of electronic equipment saying, you know, identifying if you've been hit or not. And they would say, they make a decision there, they'd say, those three uh, anti tank guns have knocked out your entire, uh, basically, company of tanks. They do that type of thing. So it could appear unfair, and there was quite a lot in these, uh, in these maneuvers in this period, a bit of that going on. They try and balance out what they were trying to do, and their argument was, we don't want the infantry and cavalry to become too disheartened by this. So they would try and make the tanks look a little bit worse than they were. The problem for the Royal Tank Corps is at this stage, the tanks are getting a little bit worn out. There's no real money to replace them. Only had about 160 of them. Uh, you can only evolve too much. This is a, just an interesting shot because that gentleman in there with the little head, 
put his headphones on there. That is uh, Percy Hobart. Uh, and he's leaving his second uh, tank turning out on manoeuvres. You see, still got the tents there. And then moving through this period where it's mechanisation. The idea is, for the British Army, is we don't want to be uh, based on the horse, etc. anymore. We want to move towards mechanisation. And even the people who are a bit conservative, ex cavalry men, are starting to embrace it a bit. Um, the other thing that's happening, which is important, and another thing that plays into the Royal Tank Corps brain at this time, collective brain, is the fact that from 1928, the cavalry are becoming mechanised. So the people who prefer to be on horses are suddenly having to realise that they're having to give up their horses. And it's a slow procedure. Um, and basically, the tank corps again is very jealous and they don't really want to be handing out their vehicles, but they end up having to hand out um, certain tanks, etc. Now what we have though is by sort of 34, is Percy Hobart, who started off as a Royal Engineer, joins the um, Royal Tank Corps in 1923. Um, by 1934, he's a major general, and he's basically been asked, he's tasked to come up with, to look at um, uh, tactics. So we've got, what we've got is a, basically this mobile force developing, this brigade that they use as a mobile force with combined arms warfare, etc., all playing out on Salisbury Plain. But there's a problem. The, um, the new Major General of Ordnance, which is um, Sir Hugh Ellis, who was very, very heavily involved in tanks in the First World War, has just basically, he's come in and he's getting concerned that the tactics aren't, aren't going to work for the rest of the army. And he wants to look at the, um, how there's going to be provision for the rest of the army to actually help them. Uh, this mobile force, this, this brigade that you've got can be used, but it's, um, it's really out on its own. The Royal Tank Corps have made very well on, on doing their own thing. So basically, he tasks Hobart with coming up with a, with a couple of ideas. And Hobart comes up with um, a couple of tanks that would be of, of relative use to them. Now, we'd already had designs um, for the medium. The replacement was to have a, a, a basically a cruiser tank, the 16 tonner here on the right. Um, getting multi turreted, that doesn't go anywhere. And we'd also started having light tanks, again Hobart on the right there, basically a two-man tank, which by the mark six we get to a three-man tank. Two-man tanks aren't good because the commander has too much to do in that turret. He's got to be gunner, loader and commander tank. But the light tanks, by the time we get to the mark 6B, they're effective as being a reconnaissance tank. So we've kept one, we've lost one which is the, the mediums, but we're keeping basically the light tanks. We keep the cruiser tank, the cruiser starts to come in, this is the A9, the A10, and they come to the A13. Um, the idea is that you'll have a fast tank with a um, small amount of, of, of armour, 20-30 mil. Again, use that speed, defeat the actual uh, anti-tank guns by that. And this was, once you've broken through the actual um, enemy's lines, you'd use these to exploit. So cruiser tanks have the speed, Effectively, they're giving them to the cavalry. Same type of role as they've had before, along with the light tanks. But it's this tank that is the key one for Martel. And this is the one he, he starts talking about first. He comes up with two designs. And this is the A11, really. The idea is a two-man tank. There's a problem with that already, because the commander has too much to do. But it's heavily armoured. And this is for the infantry. And this is the tank he comes up with, basically. Uh, the Cardinoid um, is the one who designs it and puts the bones and the mechanical bones to um, Hobart's basically his, his idea. And the idea is that you have a mass amount of these tanks that really will go forward only, we're talking at about five miles an hour, they'll move with the infantry and support, they're basically a moving machine gun post. So heavy armour, 60 mils worth of armour, but limited in its firepower, just machine guns. And this is the slight problem. It's this, the time this gets, so 34, when it's, when it's actually discussed in, the, in um, Hobart's report, it's nine, not till February of 1939 that they actually start appearing. And by that time, they're obsolete, which is a, basically a problem. What they're realising is that you need a bigger tank. And this is the second proposal, really, that, uh, that was put forward. And this is the um, A12, Matilda 2. That's given a two-pounder gun, coaxial machine gun, Heavily armoured, 78 millimetres of worth of armour, and this 
for the British at the start of the war was probably their best tank. Uh, again, these are designed to be used with the infantry. It's only given about 12 miles worth of uh, 12 miles an hour sort of rate of uh, speed. It's supposed to support the infantry. The problem here as well is we look at this when we get to the other um, nations is the fact that the British go down a line where they decide that they need these tanks to be the anti-tank infantry tanks. So that has only really got um, a two pound armour piercing round firing from it. It hasn't really got any HE potential. So yes, you could hit an anti-tank gun at 800 metres away, but you'd have to be very accurate and it probably wouldn't do that much of damage. It can't fire a high explosive round. So, as for it being effective for the infantry, yes, it can support it, it provides anti -tank, uh, an anti-tank presence, but it can't help them knock out um, artillery positions, it can't help them knock out machine gun positions in the same way that one could with a, a decent sized gun which can fire high explosive. And it was a big drawback to the infantry tanks. Good tank, but a drawback because your infantry really needs something that can fire high explosive. And this was one area that there was a bit of a disagreement on, and because basically when Hugh Ellis was pushing for these tanks, he said he wanted tanks that would support the infantry, and this, in my view, tends not to do that as well as it could. Um, but a decent enough tank. So by 1939, we've got another pamphlet here, Army Tank Battalions, and that's being basically pushed out, rolled out in time for 1940, where it's, they start putting these MTPs, uh, military training pamphlets. By this stage, um, Hobart's basically being put in charge of, of, of training. And really, they're only managing, by the start of, well, by France 1940, they're only managing three battalions of these tanks. This is 4th, uh, 7th, and 8th RTR, World Tank Regiment. In April 1939, they amalgamate the cavalry and the Royal Tank Corps into one called the Royal Armour Corps, one, one um, corps. So, whilst the tankies in the Royal Tank Corps tried to keep the tanks themselves, the army had pretty much come down a different route and said, look, we can't leave the cavalry out there without any vehicles, we're going to bring them in, amalgamate you all together, you'll still retain your presence, but you're generally, the Royal Tank Regiment was generally going to be featuring and, and uh, basically um, fighting in infantry tanks, whereas the cavalry would be more in the cruiser tank and light tank areas. So that's what tends to go on. The problem is there's not enough of these tanks, these infantry tanks, to give them all to um, tank, uh, the Royal Tank Regiment, so they, they start off in, a, in cruisers as well in certain instances. And here we see them. This is um, in France few weeks before the war and training. So close cooperation between infantry and infantry tanks. The problem for most units is who's in command. If you've got a tank unit and the tank commander's in command, that's fine, he knows how to deploy tanks. If you've got an infantry commander and he's in command, he's probably never seen tanks before. He's probably never worked closely with tanks. He may outrank and may have seniority on the operation, etc. He may decide to use tanks in a totally different way to their actually tactically conceived to do. And that's always a problem. And that's why you always need to have this training. But this is the type of thing that you would expect the tanks to be doing. Again, it's really got no offensive action for it there. And this is what happens. At basically, uh, uh, 21st of May 1940, at the Battle of Arras, um, an ad hoc counterattack is launched, really without infantry. They're using Effectively, um, 77 infantry tanks, this is 4th and 7th RTR, plus 23 of the Matilda 2s, and they attack Rommel's 7th Panzer Division. Rommel's not expecting this, they catch, basically Rommel's tanks are coming like the 7th uh, Panzer Division are coming across like that, going up to the sea, and the RTR comes across the 1st Tank Brigade, comes across like this, straight into their middle. They're wreaking havoc at that stage. Um, and basically the only thing that could stop them is Rommel taking command of the artillery pieces, its flat pieces, and basically using artillery at close quarters and knocking them out. And this is what you start to see. The tanks have tended to get ahead of the infantry, the infantry aren't really involved in this operation, it's ad hoc, etc. And the tanks are all sort of 
capable of being knocked out. And unfortunately, we only sent 23 um, Matilda IIs to France, um, but basically, apart from a handful of tanks that the British Army sent to France, um, we left all of them there, either knocked out or in German hands. Um, the army had been destroyed by better tactics, really. Um, the tanks were, you know, this tank was obsolete already, Matilda II wasn't. And the Matilda II was a worry for the Germans, they hadn't expected that. Um, the German, as we'll see, the German tanks were never better uh, at this stage of the war, but their tactics were far superior. Um, if we just run through a bit, the, the infantry tank idea carried on. This is the, um, basically the Valentine tank, another infantry tank uh, that comes on after Matilda, so the Mark III infantry tank. Um, these are named after the Seven Dwarfs, so we've got Snow White and Seven Dwarfs there. It's quite good. Um, all the little white dots are where the sensor has gone to work them out. Um, and basically, the, what happens is they're trying to use them as infantry tanks again, but um, people start forgetting how to use them. There may not be enough infantry on them. And, and after the Battle of El Alamein, the, the Operation Supercharge, which is chasing Rommel across the um, North African desert in late 1942, these are used, being used almost as cruiser tanks. Forget the infantry aspect, they're being used as cruiser tanks. Um, really, we're seeing, you see the light tanks, you see the infantry tanks, you see the cruiser tanks, you see the heavy tanks as different classes. What happens is, is sometimes necessity means that you have to use them in a different class, in different usages. And here we have the, the last real sort of um, basic infantry tank, the Mark IV, and this is the Churchill. Um, and they're really heavily armoured, you're getting upwards of 150 mil with some of the rework versions. And but with the two pounder gun here, this is fourth and third RTR, and they're showing off to the infantry. They're trying to get them to understand how they can help them um, and how they can use them in battle. And, and this is how we get a progression. What you start to see as well is you start to see a progression to getting guns with 75 millimeter guns and guns with um, with um, 95 millimeter guns because the infantry want close support. They want high explosives, and that's what we start getting. This is a quote from Catan uh, in 1917. Moving on to the French now. There are two kinds of infantry. Men who have gone into action with tanks and men who have not. And the men who have not never want to go into action without the tanks again. Now he's saying this after May 1917, 3rd of May 1917, when the French army had mutinied. Now, when the tanks are being used by the French, um, Basically, it, it gives the confidence back to the French infantry. They've been sort of, they've been all knocked out of them in the Nivelle Offensive, and they've really been sort of um, hammered. And the idea was to give them back confidence, and, and the tanks really kicking onto this. The French should really come up with the tank in their own sort of ideas and their own way, um, and they come up with what they were seeing as an assault tank. They were a bit peeved at the British for using the tanks um, in September 1916 because they said that they wanted to wait till they got enough of them in a mass, huge amount of tanks, to actually um, use them in one big go. And they thought that the British, by sending out these handful of tanks, penny packets, that they'd given them, they'd lost the, um, they'd lost the surprise factor, and the Germans now would start developing their own anti-tank tactics, um, which is pretty much what happened. Um, so they weren't particularly happy, but they've gone down this other route. At the start, they come up with the Schneider here. It's got a 75 millimeter gun here um, in that little response on the side there, machine guns. Not a particularly effective tank. They were trying to build 400. Production was taking ages to get going on them. Um, the problem is they put the fuel tank right at the front of the tank. So once you got hit, that fuel tank would explode, etc. Um, so. Not a particularly good tank, um, slow. Again, it's there really to help the infantry, but not really effectively. It was their first real sort of goes. That one there is the um, section described as um, an elephant with the legs of a gazelle. Um, again, their idea was to put the heavy 75 millimeter gun at the front of the, tank, at the, front of the vehicle, because they thought you needed proper artillery support, and that's what they were trying to do. 
But it's this gentleman here, um, SDN, who really is pushing it. He's pushing this in, in, in this arm. And it, they call it, um, the French tanks are called, uh, go under the um, artillery spéciale. Um, so that's, rather than having a tank called, they called it under that name. And basically, he says, we shouldn't be going in this direction with, with these very heavy tanks, building 400 of each of them, uh, plodding along, getting hit by artillery, making big targets for the Germans, etc. The time you get to the um, section one, it's weighing 23 tons, and it's struggling a lot. So what his idea is, the FT-17, Renault FT-17, and his idea is the, the B theory, is that you have masses of these tanks. They end up building 3,500 of them, and the idea is you overwhelm the German forces. There's just too many of them to hit. So for every five, for every one heavy tank you could build, Sechimon or Schneider, you could build five of these. And the idea was you just swamp the Germans with masses of these tanks and they swarm over them like bees with the infantry. And these, these are designed as infantry support vehicles. Machine gun there or a 37mm gun, these are with American troops. The Americans were coming into the war, of course, in 1918. They were training up troops, not only with British troops, uh, tanks, but also with French tanks. And this, what would become the basically six-ton tank, is a two-man tank. The driver would be sitting at the front there, you can just see him, and there'd be a, a commander in the turret. And basically, these would be going through, across trenches, like this, helping to suppress any German uh, machine guns or artillery pieces, etc. And that was how they were, would, would have been deployed in this way. Probably with more, um, struggling to find a, a, a picture with more actual tanks in them, but they would have larger numbers than those. And it was really the Americans and the French and the British who were supporting their infantry actions with these tanks. Now, after the First World War, the French really move on to, they, they decided that that the methodical battle is the way forward. Firepower is the key. And in that case, we've got, we've already spent enough money building these 3,500 Renault FT-17s. We don't need to go for anything else. We've already got those. The only thing we do need is a heavy, this is the um, Charles TC, it's a heavy breakthrough tank. The idea is, again, this is about 1921, the idea is we've got the trenches, fortifications, etc. They see themselves as having to break through German lines, and this would be the breakthrough tank. You'd have the FT-17s being used to support. And, and that's the way they, they, they're sort of moving forward. Here, we're getting support. They're, their mentality is based on the First World War. They've won. They're not navel-gazing. They're, they're not looking at examining their defeat. They believe that their tactics have been effective. And so why, why should they change it? We won the war by using FD-17s and uh, combined arms warfare, artillery, etc. with our tanks, and this is the way forward. What they're trying to do, and this is where they start struggling, is trying to incorporate into the methodical battle, which is the one they push forward, is this, how do you put tanks into the methodical battle? And that's the problem they've got. So what they come up with is, in 1926, they come up with this idea for the uh, Renault D1, and this is to replace the six-ton tank. Now, the problem is you've got two forces again. Here you've got the French infantry. They want a tank, which as they describe it, won't run away from the infantry. So they want it with limited, only about five miles an hour. They don't want it to have any sort of ability to have any independent action. They want to have a, a, a little bit of firepower with it, but they want it to stay and do the job that they want it to do. The problem is, is the French tank inspectorate are in charge of this. Now they don't want to do that. Much like the British, they're interested in mobility. So they build a tank that can go 18 kilometers an hour. So you're looking about about 12 miles an hour. And basically, it's not a good fit. Each one is, so the, the French infantry want a tank to support them. The French, the tank, French tank inspectorate is only a tank that they want that can do independent work. So it doesn't really move on. The D2 here, Again, is another example. This is another attempt by the tank inspectorate to create their own tank. It's a medium tank, really. It's not of much use to the French infantry, who are basically saying, give us something that we can actually use with our infantry. 
There's this whole debate going on in, in all the armed forces about how do you change from a pretty much horse-bound um, army to a mechanicalised, motorised army, and they start looking at motorising elements of the infantry, etc. Um, and they also start looking at basically mechanising their cavalry, and that's what the French are starting to do. And they're spending, the problem is, they're spending more money on motorising their infantry, providing lorries, etc. They haven't got much left at the end of the day for any tanks. Um, so they're not happy with this tank either. What's also happening is that the French are basically reducing conscription. At the end of the First World War, you had three years conscription for French infantry. By, the, by 20, 1924, they're down to 18 months. By 1930, you're conscripted for 12 months. The problem is, is that you can't be really trained up in tank warfare in 12 months, because after 12 months, these people then go to reserve, but in a couple of years, they've forgotten what's going on. The other problem is, is, the, is this FT-17 problem. They've still got this 3,500 tanks. You know, whilst they're obsolete, they don't want to keep building things that may not be able to be used. You don't want to spend money on a replacement that may be obsolete if you go to war. You've got to remember that Germans are still being, you know, basically being hit by Versailles and they really haven't got a force and you're looking to see who's going to be around. But also at the same time, we've got the Maginot being developed. This, you know, really, the idea is that we have this defensive structure on our border with Germany, that will protect us, and what we're going to do is we're going to actually come up with vehicles that allow us to take the fight and fight on German soil and Belgian soil. We're not going to fight on France again because we just haven't got the people. And so that starts hitting them. And what we start getting is we start getting uh, lighter tanks like the R35s, which would be used for infantry support. We've got a short 37mm there. These have been produced in numbers, but Again, the tank inspector aren't too happy about them, and they've got limited capabilities. The French are coming up with ideas, again, another infantry tank here, the FCM-36. This is probably the first time that you will see slope dharma in this way before you get to the things like T-34. Um, interesting design. Again, the problem for the French is that they've got loads of little ideas, that they've got loads of firms, Renault, FCM. Um, all actually uh, manufacturing their Hotchkiss, all manufacturing their own sort of versions and no one really tying it all together. So you have light tanks going on, you have medium tanks, you have infantry tanks, you have heavy tanks, all being developed, but no real, no one really getting the tank that they want. So we're moving around again, we're moving to the Shah B there, and that's where we're getting to the, again, a breakthrough tank. They all seem to want a breakthrough tank um, at this stage, but no one's allowed to write any doctrine for it. So what we, we're seeing with the French is that by that late 1930s period, they got um, what they call the, um, the cavalry units that are expected to basically shield the infantry who would then move up They've got the, mechan the motorised infantry who will move up to Belgium or go into Germany. You've got the cavalry who will move forward with the, the last tank we saw there, Somua. And they'll move in and um, they'll take the fight to the Germans. What they'll also need is they will need these heavy tanks that we still don't know what we're going to do with them, but they're still quite good. Um, and then, so they develop these tanks, that's from the 2C. They, 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 they built them without really thinking how they would use them. And so you have all these tank units, all in sort of independent units, um, battalions. They have got um, these mechanised um, cavalry brigades and they have got an armoured division, but they're not conceived it in the same way as the Germans. And they tend to pass these tanks around the battlefield. So when we get to sort of France 1940, these are all dotted around. Now this is a formidable tank. I mean, uh, the Battle of Stomp, where um, Guderian's um, um, Panzer Corps came face to face with um, basically uh, some Shah Bs, a German 30, well, German 37 mm anti-tank guns hit one of these over 140 times and were still not able to knock it out. So you're seeing a formidable tank. But the problem for the French is, with a lot of their tanks, 
is again, that one man turret there, that commander has too much to do, and he can't, if he's doing all that work there, he can't tell what the, the, the hull gunner should be doing or what the tank driver should be doing. So you're tempted to overwork yourself. But here we move to the Germans. Um, this is the A7V. We've got now got uh, the tank we've got a replica of this. And basically, the Germans haven't seen the tanks in the same way as the British or the French. Um, they've got that part of France that they're quite happy to keep. They've managed to build the Hindenburg system, which as the British are, um, and the French are coming up with tanks, what the Germans are doing is they're extending the width of their trenches. So you get a tank, he can cross that trench. All of a sudden the Germans widen that trench, they have to make longer tanks. And this is what's going on all the time. So the Germans aren't really, it takes them a while to really focus on, um, on the tanks. And they come up with this sort of very, very unwieldy beast called the A7V. And they use them in small detachments of five each. These don't really appear until 1918, and that's not quite the full complement of crew. You would have expected 18 men to have been inside there. Um, there's only one surviving example, and that's in um, Australia at Brisbane. But these were very sort of very hard to move around the battlefield, and it, it just shows that the Germans really hadn't cottoned on. They've got their stormtrooper tactics, um, and they were using their close infantry, they were using automatic weapons, grenades, etc. They had very good close um, infantry tactics. But the use of the, um, the tank really hadn't, hadn't caught on very much with them. They had, however, stolen some of the British ones. They captured them. Here we've got the German crosses on, being recaptured by the British again. Um, and after Congrès, they basically grabbed them and started fitting them out and using them against us. Um, and that's what they were doing. So, so their, their view of the tank really in the First World War was, oh, we messed around with it a bit, but it really isn't us. And so when, they, when the First World War ends, they don't really have a doctrine or they've not really developed it fully in the same way as the British have. They haven't done it on a massive level. Um, this is um, von Seth, and he takes over the German army. After the First World War, the Germans are reduced to 100,000 men uh, in their army. There are now no tanks, no aircraft, no aircraft carriers, submarines. Um, and, and really, they're limited to 100,000 men. What he does is he says, right, we're limited to 100,000 men, we're going to pick the best 100,000 men. And he selects the best officers, the most forward-thinking, etc. He can select, get rid, of the, get rid of the other elements that he doesn't really want. And he's pushing forward this idea of mobility. They might not have much, but he's pushing forward this idea that we, they, the German army needs to be about manoeuvre. And that's a theory that goes on through the 20s. He goes on to about 1926 or 7. Um, they're not allowed tanks, but what they're doing is they're circumventing this. Um, it's a light, basically, uh, light tractor one. But they, called, they called them tractors at the beginning, Mark II. And effectively, to hide from the, um, the Allies what they were doing, they would call them tractors, and they would farm them out to Sweden, training in Sweden and training in Russia at uh, Kazan. And the Russians were allowing them to do it because they were getting things off the Germans that way. They could see what they were training on, etc. So away from the eyes of the world, the German army didn't appear to have any tanks. But what they were doing was they were using other countries and actually training on them. The problem for the Germans were these weren't particularly good. This is the gross tax uh, type mark two. Again, very sort of early days on it. And these are all designs that come from the First World War for the Germans, and, and they're still playing about with them a bit. You can see there's a lot of, uh, a lot of indication that they're still, you know, see the large tracks there, that they're still affecting looking at a, a tank to cross the trenches of the First World War. Um, so what they're really doing in the public gaze is this. So this is the rights there, 1920s and up to the um, period when Hitler comes to power, just before that. This is what, this is really what they're doing, um, late 20s. They're picking uh, standard cars and putting basically fabrications on the side of it to make them look like tanks. So you might not be allowed to have real tanks, but you can train. And that's what they're doing. 
his wheeled vehicles coming towards you, pretending to be tanks. And that's what the German army was doing. They were saying, we are not, you know, we're going to still learn what we're doing, we're going to try out our tactics, etc. And that's what they were doing, but we, you know, we try and make them the uh, of really what becomes the, uh, the panzer troop. The Germans are moving down this path with this uh, motorization in the early 1930s towards a path where they're coming up with a, a panzer force, which is basically, um, essentially, um, tank led. Um, you've got the infantry, you've got the artillery, you've got the engineers, etc. But they're starting to come up with a panzer force. And, and Lutz is really leading. Here's the gap between von Sett and, and, and before Guderian, etc., and the others. It's not just one person, of course, because these, these generals have, all have a support staff and everyone's having an input. But they're really looking about mobile warfare and how they're moving on with it. Um, and they're sending tanks out here with the uh, Panzer I that's out in the um, Spanish Civil War and um, supporting the nationalist forces and they're coming back and they're saying this tank is just, we're not, you know, we're going to have to use this basically as a training tank now. Um, it's, it's outdated, this is 3637 um, and it, it's really got to look at our tactics. We've got to start actually using them properly. We can't, um, we can't tie them to the infantry and what you start getting is you start getting with the publication of this in Guderian you start getting the move to a a large scale panzer force that is independent it's all about being independent they're not looking to be tied to the infantry what's the point of being so tied to your slowest arm you don't want to do that they want to be independent and basically um, the panzer trooper and um, Acton Panzer, etc., is he's looking at British and French um, tanks uh, during the First World War and seeing how they were used and seeing combined arms warfare. And he's translating it into the German situation. And they're doing it on a scale that <coughs> probably the British and French can't imagine. They're making sure that they've got divisions. Hitler comes into power. It's not occurring at that moment, it's already started to occur, but he's allowing them to do it, and he's giving them the money to build up these panzer divisions. And you get, so, you start off with three panzer divisions. These have got 300 odd tanks in. You're starting to get large forces being developed, and um, they're in here. And basically, he's pushing this idea that what you need to do is, rather than supporting the infantry, you need to create a force with its own infantry inside it. And that's what he's doing, it's basically, Provide, you know, um, so you'll have tanks, you'll have armoured infantry who are up in carriers. Next to them you'll have armoured engineers, you'll have your artillery that's self-propelled, and you'll also have Stukas, etc., dive bombers, and you'll all act, and basically the idea was that you'd use surprise, mass, so masses of tanks, and basically you'd concentrate them on one area of the battlefield, and that's what they're training to do. It's basically using as many men and material as you can in one particular place and hitting as hard as you can. And once you've broken through, then you push. And because you're all motorised, because you can all keep up with each other, you don't have to wait for the infantry or hold back. And that's the idea, and that's what he's pushing forward. Here we have them training, Panzer ones. Once Hitler comes to power, of course, all the pretenses are out of the way. What happens with the Russians in Russia at Kazan is that that basically ends. And they're effectively saying, I'll give up on this. Um, we're not going to bother uh, this pretense anymore. We're going to basically, we're going to do what we want and we're going to start using our, um, our tanks and have them properly in, in, in operations and trials. Starts to give you an idea. That's Panzer Regiment 2, which is 1st Panzer Division. That's starting to show you how many tanks you're going to get. That's just one Panzer Regiment. It's on a huge scale. And then that's the difference between what the British were doing, the British were being leading, but the Germans take it on. And they start creating this panzer force that is very mobile and very mechan mechanicalised, basically. Here, Panzer II, again, 20mm gun. Panzer ones were just armed with the machine guns. This is the Nubal Fuzzug, basically. The idea comes from the gross tractor, you can start seeing it again. It's got the little sub turrets there. Again, a strange one for the Germans. They used them out in Norway. 
and it was a strange sort of cul-de-sac. Uh, didn't really work for them, and and really was a dead end for them in that respect. But this was was this comes in in um, 1935 and is the Panzer IV. And what you can see is the L24 short 75 mm gun there. It's basically the idea was to have an escort tank, basically. Um, one that could do fire support, and that has a 75mm gun. At that time, that short 75 was capable of knocking pretty much any vehicle out there when it first comes in, and that 75 gives that ability to use it in um, to knock out artillery weapons, knock out anti-tank weapons, and gives the Panzer forces a decent-sized weapon. The problem for the Germans is when they go into in Poland in 1939 and in France in 1940, they don't have an awful lot of them. So is the Panzer III. The Panzer III's, fit here with a short 37, are your tank killing tank. Basically, that's the idea of it. Um, there's no real pretense at proper armour on these. They're only really you know, designed to stop um, SMK bullets and armour piercing rounds. Um, and, but the whole thing is mobility, and they're really about pushing forward. And here with the Panzer III, this would engage enemy tank forces. So your Panzer III and Panzer IV are your, your key tanks of that period going into the uh, Second World War. And the great thing about the German designs, whilst they're box light, is you can adapt them throughout the war. And that's the key, one of the key things. And they're capable of doing it. The problem is, though, there's no real tank for the infantry. The infantry's left there on its own. So you've got this Panzer force that's very new, got all these you know, bits of kits being given loads of um, material, allowing it its mobility to develop, etc. And you've got the infantry with very little. See, so it carries which developed into World War II, so it allows the infantry to keep up with the, um, the Panzer Force. Giving you an idea of the sort of scale, this is um, France 1940, the sort of scale that a Panzer Division would create, um, sheer amount of um, logistics going, creeping up the back there. It's very, very material led, very, very heavy, and very, very expensive. And this man's not happy with that. This is uh, von Manstein, and in 1936, he basically wrote a report, a paper, on why the infantry needed its own tank. And what he does is he takes it with the artillery, so you get what's known as Sturm artillery. So the artillery take on this role. And basically, he's saying that we can't, in this economic climate, spend all our money and on the Panzer Force and have this very elite mobile force when we've got infantry who are still being horse-led and horse-drawn and they've got, you know, they're lacking these modern weapons. So, and that's the bulk of our army. So his argument was to have these independent, basically, um, Sturm up, but uh, ba batteries, basically, with these Sturmgeschützes in. And what we're seeing here is, again, short 75 millimeter gun. And so from 36, the designs start, start moving forward. This is based on a Panzer three, so the, there's holes already there. And what you could do, for every two Panzer threes you could build, you could build three of these. And what you're seeing is, you're seeing this, basically, a support weapon for the infantry. The idea is that they want a vehicle that can knock out the artillery, the machine guns, anything that they need that stays with them and is an organic component to it. And von Manstein sees these as being basically having a Sturmgeschutz battalion with every infantry division. They have their, all, their own organic armoured fighting vehicle. He says at this stage as well, these are not tanks and they are not to be used as tanks. That's the key thing. He likes the fact that they've got the ability to raise their, um, their barrel up and fire as artillery pieces. They can do direct fire, but they're not to be used as tanks. The key thing is they're separate. They're a separate doctrine away from the Panzer troops. The Panzer troops can always go off and do what they want. They're independent, and they move away from the infantry and leave, leave the infantry um, standing on their own. What he wanted was to come up with a force that would give an armoured force that would allow them to have protection themselves. And basically, with these 75s, it's got stronger an armour than the Panzer III, 50mm at the front there. He's effectively giving them a very capable weapon system that evolves through. Um, 
And here you can see it here, it's 363 with a long gun. These basically being out, used out in the Eastern Front, they're sometimes the only armoured fighting vehicles that the infantry will have, and they become very, very important for these units. Um, the, the, the Panzer divisions can operate as Panzer Corps, move on their own a bit, but these are the infantry's support mechanisms. And it's this division between the Panzer Force and the Sturm Artillery that's probably the most important. And it's this separation. Von Manstein sees that this has to be done this way. You can't allow the Panzer Force to have control of these tanks, of the, uh, these vehicles, because otherwise they'll incorporate them and take them away from the infantry. And it's the infantry that needs them. So he's clearly seen what is necessary for infantry tactics. For the Russians, we have a slightly different problem. They are basically, for the Red Army, um, we had the revolution in 1917, etc. They pretty been, the, the Russian army had been outfought by the Germans pretty much in the, in the First World War, and they had no experience of tanks. The only time they get experience of tanks is against them. And this is in 1919, when the white Russians, reinforced by the British, in, in the north and south, um, send about 45 tanks, along with the French start sending FT-17s, etc. This is their only experience of tanks, um, small numbers, but they're used as a terror weapon. The first, first reaction that the Russians have to these tanks, the Red Army has to these tanks, is the same way as the Germans have. Ah, it's a terror on it, run, we don't know how to stop these, we've got nothing to stop them. But there are so few of them, and the mechanical reliability of them was bad, that they tended to break down. And once, um, there's a lot of talk at that time of, of the fact that some people didn't see them as, as, as such a major force, because there were only handfuls of them, and they saw the Red Army as really being about infantry. Now this kicks on, and when the White Russians withdraw, 21, the tanks are left there. They capture these tanks, and basically they make their own schools up. But it's not really being pushed that, that much forward. Um, they tended to take the tactics um, in the same way that the Germans did from the British and the French. Again, they're referring back to the First World War, and they start to develop their, their tank tactics based on what happened on the Western Front. So nothing peculiar to it. Nothing really had happened during the, um, the Russian Civil War to, to really develop their own sort of tactics because they never had enough vehicles and hadn't built any themselves so they looked to the Western Front and that's, that was the key idea for them. But they start progressing and they start moving forward and these tanks here, which is a T26, are based on the Vickers um, E-Tank and so they're equipped with here a light machine gun and a 37mm gun there in these twin turrets and it's really these tanks that evolve in the 1920s and into the 1930s that you start getting with the Russians, um, and because they're actually they're, they're obviously cooperating with the Germans, they're getting quite a few ideas of them. They don't want to reveal too much themselves, but they're getting a bit of knowledge and technical knowledge. And of course, at this stage, when you start going into the five-year plans that the Russians had, there is a little bit of, of they want to prove themselves as a mechanized a a mechanized nation. And part of this is you know we can identify with the tanks. There is a problem as well because they do have that problem that the Red Army is the um, proletariat, it's the mass of the peasants as well. So, you know, we have to make sure that we don't move away from that, we have to support the infantry. So they have a little bit of a slight uh, challenge going on with themselves. And what we start seeing is we start seeing the T26 being used really as a support weapon here, it's out in. Um, 1939, only 40 um, fighting against the Finns. Um, and this is really a support weapon, 45mm guns coming into them, um, machine guns, etc. They're being used with the infantry and supporting it. And doctrines being being created by the Russians. Um, they come up with two things called um, is it PU uh, 29, which is their doctrine in 1929. Um, and this is uh, Tushachevsky, who's basically their armoured, um, one of the major armoured advocates. And they're pushing for sort of two types of tanks. Well, they, they, they're starting to come up with two types of tanks. They still see 
as the infantry as being the primary aim. So you have to support the infantry with tanks, and that's what they're doing. But they're starting to realise that there may be something else there. And it's Tuskevsky who's starting to look at deep operations. What the Germans are doing in the same idea with their mobile operations, and the British have been trying to do with um, using their mobile force to hit the rear areas. And that starts coming into their thinking. Um, and Trusievsky and his group start thinking about deep battle, fighting on the offensive. The, the, the Russian th philosophy is, don't fight on our soil, take it to the enemy. That's what communism's about, is about promoting it outside. We don't want to fight in a, basically on our borders, we want to take it out. So they're looking at an offensive battlefield, really. Um, but they're looking to basically have these, um, these tanks being supported by the infantry. And at this stage, they still see it really being that. And they come up with a division between the PP tanks, which support the infantry, and the DD tanks, which are used for these long-range battles. And that's uh, just, yes, there. Um, the problem is, is this keeps manoeuvring on, and it keeps evolving, and the deep battle bit gets a few skeptics, especially in the high echelons of the of Soviet high command. Um, they can't quite see it. They, for them, it's all about supporting the infantry. As I've said, the Red Army is about the proletariat, mass infantry formations. You need to have tanks that are kept with them. And it's all about that in their eyes. Um, what he's suggesting is, no, what we should be doing is we should be having armour that has its own infantry support, carrying carriers, with its own artillery, and we should mechanise it with, we should be mechanising our cavalry and pushing it forward. We should also be supporting the infantry, he's saying, shouldn't we not doing that? But we should be doing this deep battle as well. So we, they're coming on two bits. And this becomes PU 36. The problem is, he's basically, his support is gone in the Kremlin, and he's wide open. And because people don't like it, Stalin doesn't like deep battle theory, in the purges of 37 and 38, he's gone, and his whole clique's gone. Now this has a major damaging effect on, on, on Soviet uh, um, armoured theory and doctrine, because they fought back to the infantry tank idea, and they stopped thinking about providing these mobile forces. What you want to be doing is coming, looking at in, in both ways. You want to support your infantry, but also having these mobile forces. And basically, they say, forget about the mobile force, Let's just concentrate on supporting the infantry. By this time, we've got the BT, BT series of tanks. This is based on the Christie designs. Walter J. Christie is an American, which influenced the cruisers back in the UK. But these are fast tanks to be used, um, exploiting once you've broken through, etc. And this is what you'll be doing with your infantry, etc. Moving forward, hopefully going in there. But with this um, removal of Chuskevsky and his group, you start to see this basically, basically the tank corps being removed and basically the tanks are there to support the infantry. And, and we start seeing designs that uh, these are for breakthrough tanks, so T-28 here, very much like, like the same idea that the independent was for the British, multi-turreted, landship type tanks, and T-35 here, again, Two turrets there, main turrets, etc. These large tanks, the breakthrough, trench warfare type ideas, and they're not really there to support the infantry, and they get they basically get decimated in the first few weeks of the um, when the Germans invade in 1941. What you do have though is two key designs that come out, and the KV-1 here, um, heavy tank, sloped armour, a 76 mm gun. What the what was very important was, with the Germans training in Russia, they thought they knew what the Russians were thinking, and they thought they knew what they were going to expect. And they really had got it so wrong. They thought they're going to be limited. The Russians had taken the the Russians had even taken the wrong ideas out of um, out of the Spanish Civil War. They believed that um, the way forward again was to do have these um, T-26 supporting the infantry and using them in a methodical way, pushing forward. They, they've not really grasped the, the, the full um, mobile forces bit. But what changes is these tanks are modern. So these start appearing in 1939, 1940, and they're capable. And they stay their hand in Finland. They don't use them there. So the Germans aren't expecting these. 
Um, and it's really the KV and the um, T34 here. Um, again, it's that what happens is the attack on the Soviet Union in 19, June 1941 means that the, the Russians realise that they've made an error in getting rid of these mobile forces. They've seen what the Germans have done in Poland, in France, and now in Russia with these panzer forces. And they realise, hey, we were on the right track in the first place. Let's start creating these mechanised forces again. And they start creating, with these very good tanks, T-34 and the KVs, they start being able to do an awful lot more. You're not restricted by the fact that it's got a small gun. You're not restricted by the fact that it's slow. These are very capable tanks. They can do multiple tasks. So here they've, they've got infantry with the SMGs. They would have had these own um, components with them, their own sort of motorised infantry. And rather than spend all your money on building carriers and, and looking at the other arms and, and trying to bring those up, what the Russians do is they spend their money on building tanks. And they decide that if you put grab handles on, these handles on the side of the tanks, your infantry can follow you in with it. And these are known as tank riders. And the, the Russians really progress with this. And, and, and here, pushing through here again. KV's going through. It's, it's really supporting the infantry with these tanks with a large 76mm gun that they move away. They've learnt. It's interesting to see that at um, Kalpengol in um, up at Manchuria against the Japanese in 1939, just before the start of the Second World War um, in Europe. They, they really, Zhukov had been fighting out there and he'd used tanks in this way. He'd used tanks to support the infantry, but he'd also used the mobile force to defeat the Japanese. So a separate independent tank mobile force. What was interesting at this time, they're still in this mindset, the, the Russian high command, that this isn't the way forward. They see this and they decide that they'll take other ideas out of it. They see that the, with Spain, with other operations in this time against the Japanese, that the key thing to take from this was the infantry tank, was the fact that the infantry and the tank should be together and they shouldn't be separated. It took that invasion in June 1941 to basically shock them back into what ideas they've had before. And I think that's it. Okay. Well, that's it.